so uh, the purpose of this lecture is just to serve as an introduction to the actual lecture, which will be the, the three other ones. So uh, if you are already familiar with uh, uh, league groups, discrete subgroups, you, you won't learn anything. You can leave if you want. <laughs> so and today there won't be discrete subgroups. It is just a, a crash course on uh, uh, league groups, uh, semi-simple semi league groups, <coughs> and uh, their interplay with geometry and structure results. So it's, uh, maybe it will be a bit quick, but okay. So, uh, what so the so the, the purpose today is to discuss semi-simple league groups and structure results that will be used in the in the next lectures. And so w the first question is, what is a semi-simple league group? And uh, the answer so. I'll in, in this lecture, G will always be uh, semi-simple, uh, so I sh should say connected, semi-simple Lego. And uh, the first question is, what is this object, if you are not uh, very familiar with this? So the answer is, uh, it means that G, which is the Lie algebra of G, is semi-simple which is not a very satisfactory <laughs> answer. <laughs> so the, the, maybe the, first, the next question is, what is a semi-simple Lie algebra? And I will give you a formal definition, which, which is that uh, so when you have a Lie algebra, you say that a subvector space I include a J is an ID all if when you do brackets of elements of G and I, you still keep <coughs> elements of I. So uh, uh, actually, saying that you are an ideal is saying that you are the, the Lie algebra of a, a normal subgroup of G. And uh, saying that G is semi-simple is saying that any ideal in G which is also abelian, meaning that a Lie bracket when restricted to I is trivial, is the is trivial. There is no abelian ideal in G. So for the moment it's not very clear what it means. But I think it's better explained when I state a theorem about Lie algebra, semi-simple Lie algebra. So when I have a Lie algebra of matrices, you are all, surely all familiar with the notion of irreducibility. I will say that V is irreducible for the action for the action of this algebra, this set of endomorphisms, if <coughs> for any W uh, subspace of V, if W is stable under the action of this Lie algebra, then W is either the trivial space or the full space. This is an irreducible action. And you say that V is totally irreducible if you may write V as the direct sum of VI and VI are irreducible. You may split your space as a sum of invariant subspaces, and each of them is irreducible. It's not always true that an action is totally irreducible. If you, if you look, for example, at the action as G as being the set of matrices of this form, okay, R2 is not totally reducible. And then, here comes a fact that uh, I can state it as a theorem that if you take G inside GLE, so an algebra, a Lie algebra of matrices, and you assume that V is irreducible, <coughs> then you, this implies that you may write G, and in, it's, uh, it may be decomposed in a, in a actually unique way. Did you mean totally irreducible or totally reducible? What did I write? Totally irreducible. Totally wrong, totally reducible. <laughs> <laughs> totally reducible. Thank you. Ah. 
Here, totally reducible. This one is fine. This one is fine. Wow. Thank you. But I don't understand. So G is three-dimensional, and then what R2 are you talking about in G? No, I, I, I look at linear action. It's big. This is its side. So they're endomorphisms of R2. And so if V is actually an irreducible module for G, then G may be written as a sum of a center and a semi-simple part. So what it means, it means that Z is just abelian, and it's actually isomorphic to R or R2. It is is, and, uh, and G... Z and S commute to each other, and S is semi-simple. And there is a converse statement, is that if you take a, an algebra of matrices, and you assume that it is semi-simple, then actually V is totally irreducible. Ah, zut. <laughs> zut is French, you cannot understand. <laughs> okay, so what, what these two statements say is that it's, you can give a formal definition of what a semi-simple algebra is, and nobody understands it. Okay. But the true meaning of the definition is that a semi-simple algebra is, a semi, is an algebra that acts totally reducibly on vector spaces. Okay, and so up to some abelian factor, but abelian algebras are easy to study. Okay? So once you take out some abelian part, something that acts tot irreducibly is just a semi-simple algebra. This is the same object. Okay? Up to the problem of these abelian factors. Okay. <laughs> so this is what semi-simplicity means. And there is a, a third statement that I would like to, to give you. Uh, it's a statement about, so, and I, I should also say that over R, every, every algebra is linear. That is, when, when you start with an abstractly algebra, you can always find a faithful representation, okay? So when I say that I'm describing algebra of matrices, I'm actually describing all algebras, okay? And <coughs> a last property is that if G is semi-simple, then you can always write G, it's like total reducibility, as a sum where G i are ideals, and they are simple. And what simple means, it means that simple means there are no proper non-zero ideals. Okay, so this is what semi-simple algebras are, this is just, just the people that act irreducibly, and Every algebra, simple algebra is the sum of simple. And the point with the uh, uh, semi-simple algebra is that it's not an untamed object. It's, a very, it's a, an object that is absolutely known. We know the Lie algebras. It's not some strange, abstract thing that we want to catch up. Th this work was done 100 years ago. Okay? So we know the list of all simple Lie algebras. And this list, I can give it to you if you want. And if you don't want, I still give it. So instead of giving the list of simple algebras, so when you, when you know uh, uh, the Lie algebra of a Lie group, you know the Lie group up to covering. So I will give you a list of simple Lie groups. And this list, the Lie algebras of these simple Lie groups, are all the Lie algebras, OK? All the simple Lie algebras. And meaning that all simple Lie groups will be equal to one in this list up to some covering. Okay, so what is a list? So the first list is the example that you see in every lecture, that you have as a simple linear group. For n equal 1, it's not uh, semi-simple. Then you can take linear group over C. Okay, and you take also, uh, you have symplectic groups. So symplectic groups are the groups that preserve a non-degenerate skew symmetric a bilinear form on some then necessarily even dimensional vector space. And you have the same over C. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> and then you have orthogonal groups. So I will start with the orthogonal group over C, where there is only one quadratic form. And here, for this to be semi-simple, I need n to be at least 3. And if you look at forms over R, you have orthogonal groups of quadratic forms. So I hope. And uh, also, you have something which is Hermitian forms over, uh, over uh, C. OK. And uh, I hope I'm not forgetting. So, and you have a version of Hermitian forms over quaternions. And here you can take. OK, this is the same as Hermitian forms. But now, the base field is the quaternions. And then, actually, there are two other groups which are related to quaternions. So there is no standard notation. There is a, I'm using the notation of the Elgason book. So you have SU star n. So surely n has, ah, it's written this way in the Elgason book. And you have SO star 2n. So we can discuss this later, if you want some examples. And these are, this is essentially the same as SLN, but over the quaternion. And here, this one is related to the fact that when you work with quaternions, so the three last ones are related to quaternions. And when you work with quaternions, you have symmetric Hermitian forms, but you have skew symmetric Hermitian forms. And due to the fact that the field is not commutative, this is not the same object. So this one is related to skew symmetric Hermitian forms over quaternion. Okay? And so I'm cheating you because I'm, I'm I told you I will give you a list of all simple Lie algebras. This is not what I'm doing. These are classical simple Lie algebras. And if I want to give you the full list, now I will just say you that there is finitely many. And finitely something like 20 or 30. I forgot the number. Sorry, I forgot to check. OK. Yeah. Are you interested in letting here Q be zero so that you include compact groups? Yes, yes, I'm including everybody. Yes. P and Q be, can be zero. Okay? So for the moment, I didn't ask my Lie group not to be compact. Okay? So you have finitely many, and finite is not big, it's uh, 30, or I don't know, I, I forgot the number. Okay? And basically, you have infinite lists, uh, finitely many lists, okay? and finitely, then some examples which are called exceptional Lie algebras. And mostly, we could say that all the structure series that I will give you today is just intended to cover these exceptional cases. Okay? Because there is a lot of language about Lie groups that actually, when you check it on every guy in this list, is absolutely trivial. Okay? So if you're somehow, if you are not interested in exceptional Lie algebras, you can leave the room now. Okay? Because often when you see a talk where semi-simple Lie groups come into play, the speaker starts by saying, okay, if you don't care for semi-simple Lie groups, just focus on the SLNR example. But what he does for the SLNR example, you can do it for each of these finitely many cases. And it will be exactly the same. Okay? Yeah, very explicit. Okay, so I will, what I will try in this talk is to give you maybe one or two other examples in the list to, to really show you that this is really what happens, okay? That mostly the theory is written in this complicated abstract frame way just to, to have a language to cover the exceptional Lie algebras which are a bit difficult to catch sometimes, okay? So now there is a relation between semi-simple Lie groups and geometry, negatively curved geometry, and uh, this is a... Uh, one of the reasons this conference takes place that uh, <coughs> some uh, um, some properties of, uh, as, as, uh, of geometry come into play when we work with semi-simple Lie groups. And this relation was discovered by Elie Cartan, so, so more than uh, 130 or 40 years ago. And so to introduce this relation, I need to introduce the first structure property, structural property, which is related to maximal compact subgroups. So surely you already heard about it. And the point is that 
there is a bit of the, uh, 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 just a technical difficulty is that in this framework of Lie groups, actually, it's a bit difficult to define maximal compact subgroup. And you will see one minute why. For linear Lie groups, there is no trouble. Okay? So I will first cover the linear case. So what happens is that when you have any semi-simple Lie groups, you always have the adjoint representation, which is a representation toward the group of automorphisms of Lie algebra. And it turns out that if I take the connected component of this group, this adjoint representation is just a cover. Okay, so you have, in, in the family I told you, when, when you know uh, 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 Lie group, you know the Lie algebra of a Lie group, you know the Lie group up to a cover. But among all the guys who share the same the Lie algebra, there is the smallest one, the most folded one, and it is this one. So this one is called the adjoint group. So if G, sometimes you, you read, if G is adjoint, saying that G is adjoint is saying that this cover is actually the identity. Okay? If G is adjoint, then, or in general, if G is linear, I could say, then G admits maximal compact subgroups. And we will come to back to this, to, the, to making this more precise in one minute, but first I discuss the general definitions. And uh, in general, by definition, a maximal compact subgroups of K of G is the inverse image of one in, 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 uh, in the adjoint group. That is, I take an, a maximal compact subgroup here, which exists, and I pull it back by the adjoint representation. So you, you could ask me why I do this complicated business. The reason why is with this definition, which is the only one that can work for abstract semi-simple groups, a maximal compact subgroup is not necessarily compact. Because the problem is that this cover here, when the group is not linear, this cover could have infinite degree. So I'm pulling back a compact subgroup by a cover with infinite degree. I, can get, I get, if the cover has infinite degree, that I get a non-compact group. But still, the terminology is this one. So this is called the maximal compact subgroup. This is terminology that's make, that will make things consistent. It's a, it's a bit of a trouble, OK? So this is why somewhere you see that people say, let G be a linearly group, linear semi-simple group, because this avoids this kind of trouble, okay? And what? Can I just make a quick comment? I mean, if you ever hear someone say of Horace Chandra type, this is also what they mean. If you're reading a paper where you see this phrase, they mean that this is a finite cover so that you can make sense of complex subgroups. And <coughs> so the, the only somehow, the only counter example is the case. So the counter example is when the fundamental group of the adjoint group is infinite. And for example, this is the case if, if uh, G, the Lie algebra is SL2R, okay? Then you know that if you take G to take the universal cover of SL2R, okay? Then K, if you take K, so inside SL2, say we will, SL2 is not adjoint, I'm cheating a bit, but the maximal compact subgroup is SO2, okay? <laughs> but when you pull it back by this cover, this cover, the, the pi 1, of uh, uh, SL2R, the fundamental group is Z. It's a cyclic group because it's the same. The fundamental group of a group is the same as the one of its uh, co maximal compact subgroup. So here you have a cover by Z. So when you pull it back is a universal cover, what you get is, uh, is a real group. Okay, it's a real line. It's, but somehow you, okay, you, it's, it's not a big trouble, but it's a bit perturbing because you say maximal compact, but it's not compact. Okay. And uh, so there, there is a theorem, I think it's due to Carton, which says that uh, all maximal compact subgroups are connected, conjugate to each other 
and equal to their normalizer. So the last statement says that when you look at G mod K, the quotient of G by a maximal compact subgroup, you can think to it, since K is equal to its normalizer, it's the same as the set of all maximal compact subgroups. Okay. Ah, and let me, so I will give you an example, for example, in this list. Ah, do you, we have color? No, no color. Ah, yes. I will write, in some cases, what is a... So here's a maximal compact subgroup, it's SON. Here it's SUN. And here in SP2N, you see, you have a copy of UN. Because SP2N, UN is a group that preserves a positive definite Hermitian form on C to the N. So that when you look at the guy in UN, they preserve the imaginary part of a Hermitian form. In the Herm imaginary part of a Hermitian form, is a non-degenerate symplectic form. It's a, it's a symplectic form, okay? So there is an embedding of UN inside SP2N. And it actually is a maximal compact subgroup. And uh, uh, this one, it is uh, the same as um, SP, uh, the symplectic object that is here. It's SP, so surely I'm lost now with uh, dimensions. It's SPN, okay? <coughs> I could continue, that is, uh, for SONC, uh, what you will get is uh, SON, etc., etc. I, I could continue the list. Okay, so again, you see that in these examples, everything is explicit. It's not some very strange object, etc. And if you want to prove conjugacy, you will do it. It's not very hard, okay? Just, you don't need some abstract, complicated thing. So, still a bit of work, but it's some linear algebra, okay? So I, I want to emphasize the fact that the theory of semi-simple group is, first of all, an explicit theory. So now that we have this object, this quotient, the set of all maximal compact subgroup, we will do some geometry on it. And uh, uh, so first I why we can hope to get geometry on this quotient is because there is an example that everybody knows. Everybody who did a course in uh, Riemannian geometry, it's an example where G is SO1N. And uh, in that case, K will be what is denoted in the book of Elgasson by SO1N something of this form, what it means is that you preserve, if you preserve a quadratic form, it is of the form x1 carré, uh, square, sorry, uh, zero. You preserve a quadratic form of this form, then inside the orthogonal group of this quadratic form, you have the group of all matrices, where you preserve here you have a positive subspace, a negative subspace, and you look at the matrices, which preserves this decomposition, okay? And this is now a compact group. And since you want to work in S, it means that you have to ask that the determinant of this matrix is one, which is the meaning of this S in front of the product, okay? And here you have this maximal compact subgroup. So in general, I could add a guy in my list and write that what I have is, is S of OP cross OQ. Okay, and in that example, what happens is that G mod K will be the same as a real hyperbolic space. And what it means is the same, it means isometric, so it means that I will put a Riemannian structure on this space. And the reason there is a Riemannian structure is because generally, as soon as you have a Lie group, this is a feature, a standard trick of Lie groups, that when you have a Lie group, if you have G that is a Lie group, and you have H inside G, which is a closed subgroup, so the general principle is that if you want to put a structure, putting a structure 
uh, a d invariant structure. I should say, sorry. A d invariant structure. on d mod h is the same as a h invariant structure on g, the quotient of Lie algebras, okay? Because this quotient of Lie algebras, inside this space, uh, inside this space, you have a particular point, which is a class of h. So you have a marked point on that space. And this quotient space here, it may be seen as a tangent space at that point. Okay? And when you start, so here in that space, yeah, this space is something like it. You have the class of H, okay? and what this G mod H is, is the tangent space. And what I'm saying is that if I have something which is N locally H invariant, close to this point, then I can move it by the action of G, and I get something that is G invariant at the quotient, okay? And it's uh, absolutely standard that this is the way you build structures in, <coughs> with a vague meaning of the word structure here on this differentiable manifold, just by doing something H invariant in the neighborhood of this fixed point, and then propagating along the G action. And in that case, you see it's a part in general, so now if H is compact, Then, in particular, when you look at the H in uh, the K action and G mod K, it is an action of a compact group on a vector space, so it will always preserve a scalar product. Meaning that as soon as you take the quotient of a Lie group by a compact subgroup, you always end up with a space, a, mi a manifold that carries a G invariant Riemannian metric. Okay? It's absolutely general. So, in that case, okay, what wi will happen is that. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, when G is semi-simple and K is a maximal compact subgroup, so if G is simple, K is irreducible on G mod K. And the general fact that you have when you have a, uh, <coughs> an irreducible action of a compact group, you not only have, uh, it's just sure lemma, you not only have an invariant scalar product, but you have a unique invariant scalar product. Okay? So up to, up to um, dilations. So when G is simple, there is actually up to scalar multiplication, there is a unique scalar product here. Meaning that there is a unique Riemannian metric here that is G invariant. Okay? And this is what I mean by this equality. And in general, so here this implies that there is a unique, so up to scalar multiplication, G invariant, Riemannian metric, on G mod K. And uh, in general, what will happen is that the this, when G is semi-simple, you can split G as a sum of simple ideals. Okay, maybe I should write it. And there is a third one. In general, you can split G as a sum of simple ideals, and accordingly, you can split K. Everything works fine. The splitting goes along the maximal, the Lie algebra of the maximal compact subgroup, and then K. So your, your Lie algebra it splits again, and your, your quotient splits, so that actually the, the scalar product, the Riemannian metric is not unique, but it's unique up to a dilation factor in each of the simple components. So it's essentially unique. <coughs> so 
So uh, I gave you the example of uh, SO1n, and uh, I can also give you there is another one, famous one. It is that if you took SU1n this one, this is a complex hyperbolic space, complex hyperbolic space. And then you can have a This one is uh, another example. It's and, uh, for n equal to, we know it. For n equal to, it's real, it's real hyperbolic plane. But for higher n, it's a set. Of, it's, it's some uh, some some Riemannian manifold. And uh, so uh, again, it's a smith set uh, structure theorem. Okay, du coup, carton. So G mod K is complete. And uh, its sectional curvature is non-negative. So in particular, uh, you know that such a, such a Riemannian manifold, uh, a non-negatively curved Riemannian manifold. Non-positive flicker? Sorry, when did you say positive? Non-positive non flicker. Right. You said negatively at that. Yes, non-positively curved. Thank you. <laughs> Not positively curved. It's very hard for French people to say yes. <laughs> negatively curved. But okay. uh, so it's non positively curved, yes. Woo. So I lost my point. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. So each time you have a manifold, it's a theorem that, is, that comes actually after this one. It is a later theorem by Adamar that each time you have a non positively curved manifold. Which is complete and simply connected, I should say. Simply connected. It is actually uh, diffeomorphic to a ball. Okay? But in, in that case, you, you check it by the theory. The theory will tell you that it is actually diffeomorphic to a ball. So it's, as a topological space, it is a ball. Okay? So it follows from this, but it, when you prove this, actually, you first prove this. Okay? So it's, uh, Okay, so uh, you should still follow me because it's very quick. I will now discuss. Uh, so, my, my, so now I have introduced this subject, maximal compact subgroups. I have shown you that this is actually something very explicit. Okay, I, I didn't complete the list, but still something very explicit. And uh, now we follow up with uh, um, uh, flats. Because my, my goal is to reach the carton decompositions. I want to introduce this object in this general framework. And to reach this, I need to introduce a, a new ob a, a last object. These are maximal flats. So what flats are, in uh, the case of real hyperbolic spaces, for, say, or even complex, but uh, what Flats are, these are just geodesics. Okay, but uh, for, uh, so the, you have this notion of higher rank. So SLN R, as soon as N is 3, it's higher rank group. And the maximal flats are bigger than geodesics. So I need to introduce them properly. So I will say that a flat, okay, is a flat if F is uh, connected, totally geodesic, and uh, uh, it's a connected submanifold. It's totally geodesic, and it's flat. So the, the uh, induced Riemannian metric. has curvature zero. It's called flat, flat manifold. So a flat manifold is just a copy of RG, uh, if it is complete. So geodesics are flat, OK? But actually, in uh, higher ranks, there are, are flats, which are, for example, in SL3, there are flats 
which are uh, isometric to R2. Okay, so you will say <coughs> we say that it is maximal if it is maximal for the inclusion, and the theorem is that there exists there exists maximal flats, and they are all conjugated. So we'll come uh, in one minute. You will see again that this theorem is just written in this complicated form to have a general language that applies to all examples. But in that in concrete examples, it's a very explicit property. Okay, we we'll come back to this. Let me just so in case of H, H and R uh, of real hyperbolic space, what a, a flat is is just a geodesic, and you see that as soon as it gives you a geodesic, there is a group of isometries that preserve, if you are familiar with hyperbolic geometries, each time I give you such a geodesic, you have the group of all isometries that preserves the geodesic, and it's a, uh, so its connected component is a, a group that is isomorphic to R. So you have all translations along the geodesic. And this is true for any maximal flat. So if you have a maximal flat, if you have f inside g mod k, which is a maximal flat, I will associate it. I will define the, an associated subgroup of j, so, uh, which is uh, traditionally denoted by a, the associated Cartan subgroup. So it's a, there is a problem with terminology because uh, it's, uh, there is something that is called a Cartan algebra. And it's, there are two meanings. So, but here I will call Cartan subgroup. Uh, the, the, uh, gr the group that I will define now associated to a flat. So this is just a connected component. of the set of G's in G, which preserves the flat. Okay, so here I say connected component because if you see the example of H and R, you have the group of trans translations along the Leo geodesics, but you have some symmetries that preserve the geodesic. You can exchange the two fixed points, and that I don't want to allow. Okay, this is why I'm saying that I take the, max the connected component. And uh, this group, uh, this is uh, A is uh, isomorphic to R to the R for some R, where R is just the dimension on, of the flat. Meaning that what I'm saying is that A acts simply transitively on F. Okay. This is not obvious, but it's true. It, okay. And you see, this is exactly the case, uh, again, in this picture, it's a hyperbolic example. Okay, you, 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 if you know the translation length of an element, you know the element of a hyperbolic element. Okay. So what is this group in examples? In this group in examples is the one that you surely already have seen. That is a. Uh, uh, So let me uh, develop two examples. The uh, first case is uh, G equals SL and R. Then you can take for A. Uh, A is not uniquely defined because there are several maximum flats, but it's defined up to conjugacy. So for A, you can take the group of all diagonal matrices with positive entries. With the restriction that the matrix must belong <coughs> to SLR. And uh, but now uh, we can take other examples. I don't know what is your favorite one here. Maybe we can play this game. Question over here, I think. Yes. Uh, for the for the fact that A is a billion, uh, if you take a geodesic in hyperbolic space, you can have a rotation in the normal part. Of the ah, sorry, sorry, I forgot. I didn't define it properly. Sorry. You're right. I s you're, you're very right. Thank you. I saw to the split case. Uh, 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 you absolutely. How should I define it? What did I do? I forgot something. Okay. You're right. I made a mistake. Thank you. So 
So if I look, it's true. Okay, I look at the set of G's in G, such that GF is equal to F. And if you take the connected component, this group you can show that it is isomorphic. Sorry. Okay, you, I forgot the M part. Okay. So this group, this connected group, it's the product of an abelian part, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a part that is a vector space with a compact group. Okay? And when, when, once you have, when you have a Lie group that, is, that may be written this way, this part is uniquely defined. Okay? So the, this part, this is what is called A. So, sorry, thank you very much for saying <laughs> this. OK. So I think you, you can also characterize these things as the ones that act trivially in the normal direction. <coughs> if you want this. Yes. So in the case of SN and R, you have the group of all diagonal matrices with positive entries. So precisely, uh, you see that you have this. Anyway, in this case, you have no problem because it's connected the M would correspond, so it's not exactly this because but you have the problem of sign changes. So it's, I'm cheating a bit because it's not connected, but this is related to this. And uh, uh, if you take, so for example, so in the list, I don't know, I can take, uh, for example, uh, uh, SP2N. If you take G to be... Uh, okay, so your form here, you will take the form that is... Uh, 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 x1, uh, y2, minus x2, y1, plus, plus x, 2n minus 1, y2, n, minus uh, x, 2n, y2, n minus 1. Okay, the form. Here I'm taking a form, not the standard one. Maybe you didn't have to put the connected component over there. Then it will be really 8 times x, right? Uh, uh, no, no, it's true also for the... It depends what you call M. Okay, you can, if you want. Okay, yeah. you can do this this way. That's more standard. It works also. Uh, no, 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 because you have the, no, no, no. Uh, you have the normalizer. No, no, I want to put, it's not the central, it's a centralizer. It's not, else I will have the vile group also. You try to fool me. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you see my, I'm taking a symplectic form. of this form. And then, for this, in this case, you can take A to be the group of matrices of the form exponential T1, okay? And then I need to put exponential minus T1. Okay, so what you are doing when you take at algebra, classical algebras, okay, the way you should do it, if you want to understand what A is, you, you look at your group and you try to put an algebra, of di a group of diagonal matrices inside your group. And you, you try to do it in, in such a way that you can fit a maximal dimension. Okay, this is a recipe. So you can write all examples here, okay, you can just write them by keeping this example, these two examples in mind. Okay, you try to fit the biggest <coughs> possible diagonal algebra inside this, okay? And the, here you see that the dimension of this algebra, the dimension of this group, is n minus one. And here it's n, okay? And uh, so you know this famous integer, it's called the rank, okay? The dimension of this algebra, the dimension of A, is called the rank, the, I should say the real rank, of G because there is a complex rank. But here we are, inter we are interested in geometry, so we care for the real rank. And uh, 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 yes, so you see we have values of the real rank. So here you see that it is n minus 1, here it is n. So we can complete our list here and put the value of rank, maybe in green to change the color a bit. So here the rank is n minus 1. Here the rank is again n minus 1. Here the rank is n, it's n. Uh, ah, SO, I will not write it because it depends on the parity, okay? So ah, maybe I can write it this way. It's uh, uh, something like uh, integer part of n minus 1 over 2 
I hope I'm, I'm correct. It should be n when n is even. And uh, yes, I think it's okay. Okay. So it's the same here. Okay, so you, 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 you can write the wrong because you can write, all, you can always find someone. It's, 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 it's okay when you look at least. It's easy to find. Okay. And I will uh, reach my goal in this lecture, which would, uh, hopefully, I didn't lose everybody. My goal was to reach the carton decomposition. Maybe I will write it here. I lost these boards. Ah, no, I should give th keep this picture. Maybe, ah, how can I recover the topmost one? <laughs> yeah, there's a stick to your left. Right, on the, right there. Ah, okay. <laughs> Even if I'm tall, it's still hard for me. Thank you. So now here comes what the carton decomposition is. And again, I will do a, a picture for real hyperbolic space. So remember, my picture was here. OK, so what is a, what is a picture for real hyperbolic space? I have fixed. I have drawn, which is my quotient de mode K, my nice Riemannian manifold. And inside this Riemannian manifold, I have fixed a maximal flat, which is a geodesic in the case of real hyperbolic space. And now I will look at a particular point. I will do it in such a way that the fixed points, uh, when I write my space at de mode K, it means that I have a, a marked point, which is the origin, the fixed point of K. And I will do it in such a way that the fixed point of K belongs to the geodesic. And uh, what the carton decomposition says in this case is that if you have any point, X, you can rotate it by isometries in K, that is isometries that fix your mark point, and put it back on the geodesic. Okay, so carton decomposition is just this picture. So in general, now it's higher rank, so I draw a slightly bigger ball. <laughs> you will still have your fixed point, and you will have something now that may be two-dimensional. Di two you have a maximal flat, okay? But it's still the same picture. It's like when you catch a point, x, you move it and put it on the flat, okay? So what it says, if you look carefully to that picture, what I just said, the fact that you can move your point and put it here, You can restate it as saying that G, huh? so G is K A K. Huh? Because this point here, you have your fixed point, you call it X0. This guy, you call it GX for some G in G, a GX0. And what I'm saying is that I can rotate it. So this new guy, it's called K GX0. And what you are saying is that this guy belongs to the flat. So saying that it belongs to the flat is saying that for some a, you can write it as a x0. Okay, so the carton decomposition is just a geometric phenomenon. That you are not, an, you have marked a point, you have marked a flat through this point, and then when you take any other point, you can move it back to the flat. Okay. By an isometry fixing. Uh, By an isometry, yes, of course. By an isometry fixing the marked point. Okay. Uh, and then, since you are a kind of alien and think in the group theoretic way, you write this, okay? But actually, what you have in mind is this, okay? And you can do a bit more, because you, if you are familiar with this, you know the, that you actually you can do a bit more. You can write G equals K A plus K. This is still true, but I didn't introduce A plus. So what is A plus, okay? And uh, surely I will stop after I have explained this. So uh, you see that in this picture, you could move x here, but you could also move it on the other side. So when I choose a plus, I'm choosing a side. And it turns out that in rank one, that is when flats are geodesics, you just have to choose which side you go to. But in higher rank, you will split, for example, in rank two, in SL3, the picture in the flat, in f, 
it will be a picture of this form. That is, you will split your space inside, inside it's, instead of splitting it into two half lines, you will split it in six, this is a picture in SL3. In the flat, you will split your flat into six open cones, six cones, and you will choose one of the six. Okay, this is what A plus means. And again, if you want to do it carefully for each of the classical cases, it will be absolutely explicit. No trouble. And, uh, but I will write an abstract formulation, which will be absolutely impossible to understand. Okay? <laughs> so I will define A plus by a general language, but if you take this language, you check it on every example, it's absolutely very clear what it means. Okay? And what is, uh, so what is this abstract language? I will look at the action of A, okay, and we, on the Lie algebra, through, through the adjoint representation. And uh, there is a fact, okay, is that this action is jointly di diagonalizable. Okay, meaning that, <coughs> this A is an abelian group of automorphisms of the Lie algebra, and they commute to each other, but each of them is diagonalizable. So, it means that I can find a common diagonalization basis. So what you write it in an abstract way, you say that you can write G as a, a plus M, and I will explain later, plus a sum of the so-called root spaces. So what is A? A is the Lie algebra of the group I, A. And M, which I forgot in the first version, is the Lie algebra of the group M that we saw. I told, uh, <laughs> you, you recalled me that the stabilizer of F was the product of two groups, okay? And one is a Euclidean part, one is a compact part, okay? And both together, A plus M, this is also the set of X in the Lie algebra, such that AX is X, for any A in the group. These are the guys that commute <coughs> with the action that the doesn't see the adjoint action of the elements of the group A. And the other guys here, this is just diagonalizing. That is, you fix an eigenvalue and you get an eigenvector. Except that here it's a multi-dimensional action, it's an action of R to the R. So it's not an eigenvalue, it's a linear functional you split among linear functional on the, algebra, the Lie algebra of the group A. Because fixing an eigenvalue is a, common eigenval is a common eigenvector for all elements of the group A. So the set sigma, what the set sigma is, the set sigma, it's a subset of the, you have the dual space of the group A, okay? and of the Lie algebra of the, of the group A, and G alpha, if you take alpha in sigma, you define G alpha as the set of all guys in the Lie algebra, such that for any A in the group A, the adjoint action of A on X is the same as exponential, uh, I know, sorry, I will write it this way. Maybe, uh, I don't know how to denote an element of this algebra, maybe h. If I look at the exponential of h, the exponential, so this is a Lie algebra of a group, so this guy is an element of the group, okay? And this is the same as exponential alpha of h, x. This is a complicated way of writing that you have, <coughs> that you have a common eigenvector for the action of all elements of the, uh, of the, 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 this abelian Lie algebra. And uh, alpha, so, so this I can define for any linear functional, okay? And saying that alpha is in sigma, is saying that you really have an eigenvector, saying that G alpha is non-zero, okay? So we, this splitting here, it tells me how the, the, that is the fact that you have an abelian Lie algebra, which is diagonalizable, acting on a space, it at once gives me a splitting of this form. And the, this is natural, but the extra, the extra property here 
is that, so I should say that sigma is in A star and these are non-zero elements. And that if you take the guys that commute, you know exactly who they are. Okay? But basically the fact that if you have an algebra of jointly diagonalizable element acting on a space, you get a decomposition of the form, it's just elementary linear algebra. Okay? But from this situation, you come up, that is just by what you have shown that it is jointly diagonalizable, you come up with a set of linear functional of this algebra. So you come up with some combinatorial structure. And if you already saw something about the theory of semi-simple groups, the classification relies on trying to describe exactly there are some nice properties of this finite set. You try to list these properties carefully, okay? And then you see that it puts some restriction on what this finite set may be, and eventually this leads you to the classification, okay? It's just what uh, people noticed, uh, yes, in the, uh, I don't know, uh, something like a hundred years ago. They started this classification in the complex case, etc. And for our purpose, so everywhere, this is a, one of the difficulties of the theory when you try to write this abstract theory instead of working with classical cases, that you come up with this combinatorial theory, which is a bit hard to handle sometimes, and uh, 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 it will allow us to define A plus and the carton decomposition. So, what is A plus? That is, somehow I introduced you all the, uh, all the people that we see everywhere when you look at the language of semi-simple groups. And uh, what is A plus? So we'll define A plus <coughs> is you choose a connected component uh, of the set uh, of the, of the comp of, you take, you have finitely, you have a vector space, and you have finitely many, uh, linear functional. So each non-zero linear functional gives you a hyperplane. So you take out, huh? this is a picture I did on top, you see, in case of H and R, this set sigma, this is just two elements, one element and its opposite. So when you split the space, according to whether this element is positive or negative, you get the decomposition into two half lines. Okay? And in higher rank, you have finitely many hyperplanes. This is my picture in SL3. It's a picture here. Okay? So you have... So on SL3, you have three hyperplanes, actually. You have six elements in your set sigma, but you have three hyperplanes. And uh, you split your space, and you choose a component here. Okay? And you take the closure, because I prefer to take it closed, okay? And what A plus here, is just the exponential of A plus. And then the theorem says, you can make... And more precisely, okay, for any G in G, there exists a unique <coughs> A in A plus, such that G belongs to K, A, K. And uh, I have the picture somewhere here. And what this A means, okay, in, in rank one, this is just the distance. This data of A, it's a non-negative number, and this is just the distance between X0, which is a fixed point of K, and you have this decomposition, so you have, you start from a, a guy, and you move it here, so what you see here is a distance. And in higher rank, it should be thought as a vector valued distance. Okay? It's a vector in a cone, it's a, in a conve strictly convex cone, a properly convex cone, so it should be thought of as a, 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 a vector valued <laughs> version of the distance, and this we will see in the next talks. Okay, and I think uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will keep this. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> gives me purpose. <laughs> no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments? Okay, then we have a coffee break for 30 minutes and then we resume at 11. Yeah, thank you. Okay.